all right now, ladies and gentlemen, if you just keep together. Thank you. <coughs> now, here, if you follow me, is the corner of Fleet Street and Bell Yard. And at this very corner, in a dirty little barber shop such as you or me would be ashamed to set foot in, it was so dirty, the notorious Sweeney Todd lived and breathed and had his being. What was Sweeney Todd famous for, Guy? He was notorious, lady. He was notorious for being a murderer. <gasps> a murderer? A notorious bloody murderer, he was. But this isn't a corner at all. I thought you said it was a corner of Fleet Street and Bell Yard. All done away with, sir. All done away with years back. But underneath these here stones, listen to the hollow sound of Grizzly Memento of the 18th century, underneath these stones was the very vault where Sweeney Todd used to burn his victims and make them into veal pie. Oh. They need veal for that, oh. guy. And that's what they had, sir, human veal and human bow. Oh. Sweeney Todd used to murder his victims with a barber chair, he did. And at this very corner in sight of St. Dunstan's Church, he had his notorious barber shop. Now, if you just gather in a bit more close, we'll penetrate into the very scene where Sweeney Todd raised his grisly hand in murder. Stage 47. Item 16. Sweeney Todd. The Demon Barber of Fleet Street. An early Victorian melodrama written in 1842 by George Dibden Pitt. Adapted for radio by Ronald Hambleton. Starring Maver Moore as Sweeney Todd. Produced and directed by Andrew Allen. With an original musical score composed and conducted by Lucio Agostini. A melodrama of a London before the days of gaslight and handsome cabs. Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. Hear that? St. Dunstan's bell, just like it used to ring 200 years ago, ringing over these same streets and over streets that have gone long since. Streets covered with mud and filth, no street lamps in them days, mind you. Just a perfect breeding ground for thievery and murder. It was that very bell... What brought Sweeney Todd down to his shop of a morning, watching his miserable little apprentice putting up the shutters, and then waiting in his shop like a spider lurking in his web. Boy. Yes, Mr. Todd? A little more activity won't hurt you, Tobias Rag. Come here. Yes, Mr. Todd? I would have you remember that you are my apprentice, Tobias, that you have of me board, lodging, and washing... Except that you take your meals at home, that you don't sleep here, and that your mother gets up your linen. Now, are you not a fortunate, happy dog? Oh, yes, please, sir. How old are you, boy? Fifteen, please, Mr. Todd, sir. Old enough to have a memory, eh? I think so, sir. And remember this. I'll cut your throat from ear to ear if you repeat one word of what passes in this shop, or dare to make any supposition or draw any conclusion from anything you may see or hear, or fancy you may see or hear. Do you understand me? Oh, I won't say anything, Mr. Todd. And for lesser misdemeanors, there's a place for you at Jonas Fogg's madhouse in Peckham. If I say anything, sir, may I be made into veal pies at Mrs. Lovett's in Bell Yard. How dare you mention veal pies in my presence? Do you suspect? Hmm, do you want to lose this nice job, boy? And on your first day? Oh, sir, I don't suspect. Indeed, I don't. I meant no harm. Very good. I'm satisfied. Quite satisfied. And mark me, the shop, and the shop only, is your place. Yes, sir. And if any customer gives you a penny, you can keep it. So that if you get enough of them, you will become a rich man. Only I'll take care of them, and when I think you require any, you can come to me. Understand? We need not. All right, boy. Into the back room with you. Well, good morning, Mr. Smith. How's the chair working, Mr. Todd? It seems to have picked up a bit of a rasp somewhere. Come over here and have a listen. Don't see why you should complain, Mr. Sweeney. Todd thing it's not yet paid for. What, would you have me pay for a chair that doesn't give satisfaction? Listen to it, Mr. Smith. <coughs> a trifle squeaky, Mr. Smith. Perhaps something foreign has gotten into the works. Blood, perhaps, Mr. Todd. <coughs> Blood. What the devil do you mean? After all, even the most careful barber's hand slips a little, Mr. Todd. True. It's a delicately balanced piece of mechanism. 
Barber chairs aren't made as a rule to tip down into the cellar, Sweeney Todd. Never mind what's the rule. Your job is to see it works properly. I have my customers to think about, Mr. Smith. Tip it again, Mr. Todd. <coughs> ah, appears rusty in one or two spots. And loyal, I think. Then oil it, man, and get about your business. But, Mr. Todd. I've brought with me a little... You are surely not going to bring up again that little consideration owing to you in respect of this mechanical tire? Yes, Mr. Todd. I have with me an account for seven pounds, eighteen shillings, and ninepence halfpenny. And what may the ninepence halfpenny be for, Mr. Smith? For one pound of ten-inch nails, Mr. Todd. And has it occurred to you, Mr. Smith, that some parties might consider ninepence halfpenny a little excessive for a pound of ten-inch nails? It has occurred to me that I do not like your manner of haggling, Mr. Todd. Come a little nearer, Mr. Smith. What would you say to a guinea and a half? Certainly not. I want my... And perhaps a free shave, too? A really close shave afterwards? I would say you are a rogue, Mr. Todd. I will make it 30 shillings. Let us say 30 shillings, Mr. Smith. Has it occurred to you that certain parties not very far up this street, certain legal parties, as you might phrase it, might gain a good deal of profit and instruction from a perusal of some of the items and specifications on this little account of mine? You mean about the chair, you dog? I mean the chair and I mean the old Bailey, too, Mr. Todd. I think the amount we mentioned was seven, eighteen, nine and a half, Mr. Todd. Hmm, I was speaking of a free shave, Mr. Smith. I discern a roughness about the region of your lower lip and a hairiness about your throat that makes my razor long to be at it. Pray come in and take a seat, Mr. Smith. I'll go now, you scoundrel, but I shall be back. Yes, yes, come back next week. I shall be back before next week, Mr. Todd. Considerably before next week. Ah, he was wicked with Sweeney Todd. Glib as a sparrow and thieving as a jackdaw. Why'd as soon twist a young lad's arm as do an honest London tradesman out of his wages. But look, here's a first-rate sample of how Sweeney Todd used to do business. In fact, this is the little piece of work that finally brought him to the gallows. Too bad they didn't have electric chairs in them days. An electric barber chair would have been the thing for him. Now, young Tobias Rag was sweeping out the shop one evening. It was cold and drizzly, a regular sloppy day. And into the shop walks a chap what had sailor writ all over him. Is this barber shop open, my boy? Yes, indeed, sir. Come in. And tell your master I would use his services. Uh, but wait a minute. Do you live about here? I live over by St. Duncan's Church, sir. Do you know Miss Joanna Oakley? Oh, yes, indeed. She's a very kind-hearted lady. What you say is no surprise to me, though naturally I am delighted to hear it. Are you related to her, sir? She is my sweetheart. I've just come back from a voyage to India. I intend to marry her. Oh, that's what I should like to do. What, marry Miss Oakley? Oh, no. I mean, I should like to sail the ocean, too. The sea has its perils and its chances, my boy. I've been away for five years, not knowing when I would ever see my sweetheart again. But now I am home again, bringing her a pearl necklace for a wedding gift. Ah, oh, Tobias, my dear boy. Oh? What a time you have been. What has detained you, my darling boy? Sir, Mr. Todd, I... Has I... Captain Pearson's peruke been sent home, my dear? I don't know, sir. I thought I gave you instructions never to speak to any person when other beside you, eh? You may have done, sir. Take a that! Oh! And remember for the future what it was for. Now go into the shop and attend to your business. The next time you disobey me, I'll cut your throat. From ear to ear. Your pardon, sir. I am to blame. I asked him about a particular old friend. We got him to conversation. Your apologies, I beg. Boys will be boys, and a little mild chastisement from time to time does them no harm. Perhaps you're right. But I must protest always against unnecessary severity towards young persons. But though you are hasty, you are no doubt possessed of a generous heart. And hang me if I don't patronize you this very moment. I'm going to meet my sweetheart presently, and I think a clean face will become so important an occasion. Happy to be of service to you, young gentleman. Is it a shave you need? What am I here for but to give you a shave? To give you a closer shave than you have ever had before? Thank you, Barbara. Take the father chair, please. It's the chair I keep for special customers. <laughs> and special occasions, eh? And special occasions. Head back when I tuck in the cloth, sir. I always like to leave the throat clear. That's better. You've been to sea, sir? I've only lately come up the river from an Indian voyage. Yeah. 
You carry some treasure, I presume? Am I the brush? Among others, this small casket. Uh, this here exquisite workmanship. It is not the box, but its contents that must cause you wonder. For I must, in confidence, mind, tell you it contains a string of veritable pearls of the value of 12,000 pounds. 12,000 pounds? <laughs> what the devil noise was that? Only me. I laugh. Laugh? You call that a laugh? I suppose you caught it to somebody who died. That is your way of laughing. I beg you won't do it anymore. You will find me all attention to your orders, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ingestre. Mark Ingestre. Mr. Ingestre. It's well you came here, for though I say it, there isn't a barber in the city of London that thinks of polishing a customer off as I do. Fact, I assure you. <laughs> Shiver the main thing. I, I tell you what it is, Master Barber. If you come that laugh again, I'll get up and go. Well, very good, sir. It won't occur again, if I may make so bold. Uh, who are you? Where did you come from? And where are you going? You seem fond of asking questions, my friend. Perhaps before I answer them, you'll reply to me. Do you know Mr. Oakley, who lives somewhere hereabouts? He's a spectacle maker. Oh, yes. Yes, to be sure I do. Jasper Oakley in 4th Street. He has a daughter called Joanna that the young bloods call... Head back a little farther, sir. The flower of 4th Street. She is respected, I hope. Oh, of course, of course. Now, bless me, where can I have laid Miss Strupp? I had it this minute. Ah, I recollect. I took it into the parlor. Sit still, sir. I shan't be a minute. You can amuse yourself with the newspaper. The chair moved before I could touch the lever. What's happened is this a trick. The chair must have life of its own. No, no. Courage, Sweeney. It must have slipped. Smith must have put too much oil on it. And remember the pearls. The pearls. <sighs> when I was a boy, the first for avarice was first awakened by the fair gift of a farthing. That farthing soon became a pound, a pound a hundred, and so to a thousand, till I said to myself, I will possess an hundred thousand. This string of pearls will complete the sum. Who's there? Quick, speak up. Yes, sir. Tobias, you dog, how long have you been peeping in the door? Peeping, sir? Yes, peeping, don't repeat my words. See, sir, I wasn't peeping at all. You didn't see the chair tilt back? I didn't know it could tilt back, sir. It doesn't. Did I say it did? No, sir, but I thought... Never mind what you thought. <coughs> Who's there? Somebody else skulking about? I'll soon fetch him out. Well, what do you want? It's only the black servant of the gentleman who came here to be saved, sir. Only the black servant of the gentleman who came here to be shaved, eh? You know quite a bit, Tobias. No, sir. Tell this black servant that his master is not here. Tell him to seek elsewhere. I will, sir. Fasher. I should have remembered about the industry servant. But no matter. The pearls have come to me. And Mark Ingestre has gone to Mrs. Lovett, the pie maker. <laughs> Sweeney Todd was sitting on top of the world. Twelve thousand pounds worth of pearls at one sitting, as you might say. But not an easy thing to turn into cold cash. That's not something he could do by killing, though he would have if he could have. But he bided his time until the right man came along. Good evening, neighbor. I would have you shave me. Your servant, Mr. Parmine. I think you'll find this chair comfortable. Uh, thank you. You uh, deal in precious stones? I do, neighbor. To be sure. Everyone knows John Parmine, the lapidary and the jeweler. It's rather late for a bargain. Do you want to buy or sell? Head forward while I pin the cloth, sir. To sell. The only orders I get are for pearls, and they're not in the market nowadays. I have nothing but pearls to sell. I mean to keep all my diamonds, garnets, and rubies. The deuce you do. Will you look at the pearls I have? Where are they? Here. Hmm. Real, by heaven. All real. I know they are real. Will you deal with me or not? I'm not sure they are real, you know. Let me look at them again. Hmm. I thought so. Counterfeit. But so well done that just for the curiosity of the thing, I will give you uh, fifty pounds. Fifty pounds? Is this a joke? 
I will give you a hundred. Hark ye, friend Parmine. It neither suits me inclination nor my time to stand haggling with you. I know the value of pearls, and as a matter of ordinary business, I will sell them to you so you may get a handsome profit. Well, since you know more than I gave you credit for, and this is to be a downright uh, business transaction, I think I can find a customer who will uh, pay 11,000 pounds for them. Ah, that's better. Let me have the money tomorrow. Uh, stop a bit. You must know that a string of pearls is not to be bought and sold like a few ounces of old silver, and you must give me satisfaction as to how you came by them. Sure, man, who will question you? You're in the trade. Well, it's all very fine, but I don't see why I should give you the full value of an article without evidence to prove your title to it. In other words, you don't care how I came by the property involved so long as I sell it to you at a thief's price. Mr. Todd, I am a respectable trader. And on the other hand, if I want the real value, you mean to be particular. I suspect you have no right to sell the pearls. And to satisfy myself, I shall insist on your coming with me to a magistrate. Respectable tradesman, you'll go all right, but by the road I choose. This chair will carry you, Mr. Parmine. Ah! Off you go, Mr. Parmine. Goodbye. 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 <laughs> Sweeney Tom. <gasps> Ezekiel Smith. You! Not goodbye, surely, Mr. Todd, but how did you do, dear Mr. Todd? So, you know the secret of the pearls now. It is enough. Your bill is paid. But it has to be receipted yet, Mr. Todd. Where is Mark Ingestry? It was you who sent him down to the vault, wasn't it? But I didn't cut his throat, Mr. Todd. You are a little too clever, Mr. Smith. I do not like to have such a clever mechanic in my confidence. It doesn't altogether suit. How do you like this little tire? <gasps> a pistol? Mr. Todd, it's not loaded. Not as big as a chair, Mr. Smith, but it works better. <laughs> ah. Mr. Clever Smith, you won't do much thinking now with that bleeding head. You can take all your cleverness down below now. You can have a ride in this particular chair of yours. It ought to work well now its master is riding in it. <laughs> ah, ah, the secret is mine again. That's how Sweeney Todd went about his notorious bloody business. Lured him into his devilish barber chair, touched a lever, and down they went into the grisly vaults below Fleet Street. All he wanted was the smell of a bit of money, and he was after it like a ferret. Just one close shave, and he was cock of the walk, he thought. And all he had to worry about was doing poor old Mrs. Lovett out of her share of the swag. She was the lady that kept the pie shop next door. She was a fat, comfortable old girl, buried five husbands, and looked forward to five more. Why, it isn't to Lupin, to be sure. Just fancy coming to see little me in all this rain. Do give me your umbrella this minute, Mr. Lupin, and sit down and talk something warm or you'll die of cold. Aye, dear sister, I bear this misfortune like all of us with fortitude, believing that our sufferings here will in a future world be changed to peace and happiness. Certainly, to be sure. Therefore, I beg you to take a little drop of tea. Dear sister, you are indeed an angel. Oh, Mr. Lupin, won't you draw your chair a little closer? Verily, I will. And is it true, dear sister, that thou hast gathered unto thyself much of the memory of unrighteousness by the sale of those same pieces of manna, which the ungodly called, though, wrapped around the flesh of the petted calf? What a lovely way of saying, dear says. There is much of the memory of unrighteousness in what thou callest by. Thou hast what the wicked call a stocking. Oh, brother, let us not talk of pays. Remember that all day and all night I think of nothing but pays. And sometimes pies haunt me dreams. Remember that all day I smell pies. And I might go for pies. And I'd like to and see for pies. Verily, sister, it is a delicious text. Lo, the smell of gravy haunteth me nostrils and me so quivers with delight. Then would you like a pie, brother? Me so fighteth me so crieth out, oh, me sister, oh, me beloved. 
Then psyched one robber. Uh. Think the time they did only for you. Why, sister of a surety, this is not the tuppenly pie. No, uh, Mr. Newpin, this is a very special pie, such as I keep for callers and friends. And uh, tell me, sister, there is great profit in the tuppenly pie. Must I put in a pennyworth of the set of the car? No, Mr. Newpin, how do you imagine I'll live? I'll put in a farthing's worth, no more. Verily a magnificent pie. Of a truth, thou art a woman in a thousand. And how much flour puttest thou in a tuppenny pie? A uh, heaper, Mr. Lupin. And whence cometh thy flour, my beloved? A bird from Miller Brown. And Miller Brown hath near by his mill certain cavities in the earth containing chalk. Is he not, sister? Chalk? Miller Brown is a respectable merchant, Mr. Lupin. Oity, toity, did I say all tales? Ah, oh, sister, what a pie, what a pie was that. <laughs> Behold, me art yearneth after thy beauty. Behold, a great love will is up in me soul. Who is to take me in? And as the stocking thou sayest, Hark, I will whisper, Is it near thy bed? Oh, brother, brother, thou... You mustn't. Mr. Lupin, you are a naughty man. Ist, the beloved, which call me Lupin now. Oh, not now. Not yet. True, there are yet certain ministrations of the spirit I must attend to ere time for pleasure come in. You are such a godly man, brother. Yea, even today I was able to save a wandering soul from sorrow, even an unfortunate black whose master had left him alone in this seeming city. A black, a gentleman's black servant. Verily, even the heathen, dear sister, is What did he say about his master, I mean? Verily, I am gratified, highly gratified to find studies of mercy in thy sister. Wilt come with me to Joanna Oakley, who is suffering from a great depression of the soul, too. Joanna Oakley, a gentleman's back servant. We are undone. Undone, my beloved. Oh, Mr. Lupin, leave me at once. But, the beloved, this excessive pity for the unfortunate one seems to be a trifle, shall I say, excessive? What did you do with this back servant? I kindly took charge of a certain sum of money for him, lest he lose it, sister. What is he now? Swallowed up be deed. It till this team is city. Ah. Work of the Lord calleth his servant, and I must be gone. I will bear to Joanna Oakley expressions of your solicitude. Yes, tell her, tell her that I weep for her sorrow. Verily, a gracious sentiment. And I shall add, my dear sister, that in your eyes every tear is a pearl. <laughs> Mrs. Lovett, rather late for a call, my dear. Can I do anything for you? My mind is disturbed, Pud. The wicked manner of our lives darkens every hour and colors all my dreams with blood. Can we not reform our ways and live good, righteous lives? What drivel is this woman? You sound like that ranting parson Lupin. Lupin, I know. Lupin, oh, yes. Don't talk. Don't twist me arm like that. Me. I'll do more than that. Now tell me exactly what are you talking about? William Grant died last night. And who may William Grant be? He was my baker, Mr. T. But, my dear Mrs. L., your baker's name was Jones. But he got discontented, Mr. Todd, surely he remember. So many of them, one gets confused. But never mind. Dry those tears, <laughs> little crybaby. Mr. T., the pie shop in Bell Yard must be closed. Closed, Mrs. Lovett. The conscience is aroused. I dreamt last night that I was being hanged with a rope of pearls. My heart goes out in sympathy to you, Mrs. Lovett. You must be tired of standing. Let me implore you to take a seat. Take this chair, Mrs. Lovett. In that chair? Do you think I'm such a fool, Mr. T? Well, why not? It's a perfectly good chair. You and I have profited well enough by it in the past. It's a wicked chair, Todd. <laughs> it works very well. A trifle squeaky. But then all old friends squeak a little bit, Mrs. Lovett. Eh, hey, Mrs. Lovett? Let me go, Todd. Please, please, Todd, my dear. The management of women is much like the management of horses. Horse judiciously applied. What are we going to do, Todd? People are beginning to suspect. Oh, do you know of anyone, Mrs. Lovett? What about that gentleman with the pearl? He'll never suspect, not anymore. But what about his servant? People will speak to him. He might go to the magistrate. Now, that, Mrs. Lovett, sounds very like an idea of your own. We're in it together, remember that? Uh, remember? Come, my dear. 
Let us sit down and talk like old friends. You know, you don't mean to do anything, do you? Pray to give me, Anne. It's crushing it. I have always been noted for Miss Drinks. I want to go out. I must breathe the clean air. Let me go. Let Why me go. Why this, Harry, to be out at this time of day, Mrs. Lovett? No, no. We shall sit here quietly and talk of your troubles. <laughs> you were speaking of the unexpected demise of this, let me see, what was his name? Not Jones. What was it? I've forgotten, Todd. You are not thinking of going, Mrs. Lovett. No. Too late now. Why, then, let me hold your hand. And we will sit here holding hands like... like lovers. Now, while Sweeney Todd and his female accomplice were sitting in his barber shop, warm in their hands, so to speak, because there was only one candle in the old room in place, Dr. Aminadab Lupin was on his errand of mercy to see Joanna Oakley. She'd pretty near cried her eyes out for Mark Ingestry by this time, and her ma and pa just didn't know what to do with her. How is this, child, that you look so pale? I must speak positively about you to Mr. Lupin. Lupin may be all very well in his way as a parson, but I really don't know what he can have to do with Joanna looking pale. Tush, Mr. Oakley. I'm all right, Mama. Really, I am. Lupin has been kicked out of more people's houses than anybody else from here to Aldgate. If the sainted man has been kicked, Mr. Oakley, he glories in it. Mr. Lupin likes suffer for the faith. And if he were made a martyr, it would give him much pleasure. Not half the pleasure it would give me, Mrs. Oakley. Joanna, I, I think I feel my old complaint coming on again. Your, your father's brutality always produces it. I, I must compose my nerves with the little cherry brandy. Let me help you, Mama. No, no. I, I will suffer alone, Joanna. Well, I suppose I must offer her crumbs of comfort, as Lupin would say. Damn, Mr. Aminadab, Lupin! Ah, oh, Miss Oakley, did I hear your parents retire? Yes, Mr. Lupin, I shall call them back. Uh, dear is Joanna, I come here at the bidding of my conscience to consort with you in your dire need. You will allow me free passage from the room, Mr. Lupin. Thou art disrespectful, but I will not snub thee, virgin. Thou knowest not me mission here. I don't want your comfort, sir. What if I were to pour into your ears the knowledge that I have? If I whisper pearls in a black servant? <gasps> oh, servant, not Mr. Ingestry. Ah, I have touched a cord in thy bosom. Thou hast heeded the tongues of rumor that have been a-wagging. I do not listen to rumor, sir. Only by rumor do we learn of iniquity, virgin. It hath made a man of me and me carcass, which was as lank as an earring once, is now round and comely to look at. Oh, where is Mr. Ingestry? Have you heard from him? Oh, how long have I waited for news? I made in them news incarnate. Though I speak with the mouths of babes and settlings, I shall offer me news. If you know anything, speak, I pray you. For a consideration. Oh, anything, anything, Mr. Lupin. Then, maiden, listen. I have held converse with a certain black, for whom I was able to perform a small service. He had lost his master. He was as a ship without a rudder, as a principality without a prince. He told me of hours of waiting outside a certain shop on Fleet Street. A shop, mark you, from which his master never emerged. Where was it? I must go to him. Precipitation, virgin, is unwise. For next to this certain shop lives a lady for whom I hold a certain regard, and with whom, in fact, I have sucked and drank. When I spoke certain words to her, she blushed, and they looked pale. All I wonder is this, did she blush from a lovely excitement of the pulse at the sight of me, or did she thus reveal a guilty secret? Then how will we know? What will we do? I know an unmannerly youth who might, for a consideration, ingratiate himself within this certain lady's shop. Stop riddling, Mr. Lupin. Whose shop? Who is the lady? The shop virgin is Sweeney Todd's, and the lady is Mrs. Lovett. The pie maker. Do you think them guilty? Verily, I believe this man Sweeney to be a man of sin. I myself have a mind to test his wickedness and to introduce this youth within Mrs. Lovett's shop. Then do so, Mr. Lupin, and let me find ways to thank you. Why, you can thank me with the aforementioned consideration. What is it then? Briefly, let me take thee unto my bosom, even as a wedded wife. Absurd! 
Have you been drinking? The fire of love rages. It consumeth my very vitals. Oh, come no dearer, sir. And adventure I may extinguish the flame of my passion by the moisture of those ruby lips. Sir, are you insane? Maiden, I am resolved. Oh, one hand me, ruffian. Oh, repent. Moderation, sir. maiden, one osculation. Oh. Why, it's the hypocrite parson. Oh. There's a bit of correction for you, Lupin. Help, silly, I am a steel robber. Fire, help. Now, what put all that to confabulation with Lupin, Johanna? Oh, Papa, I'm afraid for Mr. Ingersoll. Ingersoll? Is he back again? That is why I kept it my secret, Papa. I thought you might still refuse your consent. It was because of you that he went to sea. And well, he might, the wastrel. But now he has returned, rich from India, Papa. Rich? From India? Then why doesn't he show himself like a man? He, he has met with some misfortune here in London. Mr. Lupin believes him dead, I think. Where was this? He was last seen at Sweeney Todd's shop in Fleet Street. And his, his black servant... Oh, buck up there. Dry your eyes. If Mark Ingestry is alive, we'll find him. And if Sweeney Todd is responsible for those tears of yours, he'll pay for it. And that's how the hue and cry started against Sweeney Todd, the notorious bloody murderer. Of course, it wasn't the hue and cry at first, because he was a slippery devil, but matters were coming to an end. Jasper Oakley was plotting to comfort his daughter, and as for Mr. Lupin, why he thought he might lie in his pocket. It is well that the children of the Lord should partake of the ill-gotten gains of the wicked and slip the villain of his spoils. So while he figured out a way to blackmail Sweeney Todd, he sent his unmannerly youth, Jarvis Williams, to worm his way into Mrs. Lovett's confidence. Go away, my good fellow. We never give anything to beggars. I ain't no beggar, Mum. But a young chap was trying to look out for a situation. Jarvis Williams is the name. I've seen better days, Mum. I kept up the Italy. Of the icon? Yes. You never seen such a barrel of greens and taters as I used to turn out. But Monopoly made me a bankrupt. The big shops ruins the little shops and stars out the cost of mongers. Slow time, ain't it? I well, dare so when you get into better days, you'll have quite sufficient incidents to make you intolerable. Are you, uh, from this bar? No, Mum. Nightbridge. Better picking. You are unknown about the air? Even old Bailey hasn't heard of me, Mum. Very well. You ask me for employment, and I will give it to you. Follow me. Where to? To the bike house, where I will show you what you have to do. You must promise never to leave it on any pretense. Never to leave it? Never, unless you leave it for good and all. As Shakespeare says, my poverty and not my will consent. Help me with this fat daughter. Will it be working in the bowels of the earth? Shut up, boy. It's only our vault. Coo, it's a dismal old. By this petty young Jarvis, we must descend to the furnace in oven. Well, I will show you how to manufacture the pot. These are files and might get so generally useful. And that's it, I hope. I suppose I'm to have someone assist me in this situation. One pair of ends would never do the work in such a place. Are you not content? Yes. Only you spoke of having a man. I had a man, Jarvis. He's born to his friend. He's gone to some of his old friends who will be glad to see him. Yeah, I don't like the sound of that. Have you any scruples? No scruples, Mum, but one objection. And that is? I should like to leave when I please. <laughs> yeah, I might come on easy on that score. I never keep anyone many hours after they begin to feel dissatisfied. But now I must leave you for a time. What, down here? Yes, Jarvis. As long as you're industrious, you will get on very well. As soon as you begin to get idle and neglect the orders, you will receive a piece of information. What is it, Mum? I'm an inquiring young fella. You may as well give it me now. Now, I seldom find any occasion for that at first. But after a time, when you get well fed, if it is sure to want it, everyone who relinquishes that situation goes to his old friend. 
friends he's not seen for many years. I shall return anon. manner of talking that respectable female is. There seems to be something singular in everything she says. And what a singular looking place too. Nothing visible but darkness. It would be quite unbearable but for the delicious smell of pie. Phew, what's that? A rattlesnake? It rattles anyway. You let never feel. Bones. Skull. Ribs. I must have stumbled into a surgery, because these are human bones. Wish I could find a funny bone, I feel a bit poorly. She was a nice looking old ma too. Strikes me that Lupin and her would make a nice pair. My have this bag of bones is a fellow who's gone to his oldest friend. Might be it's Mark Industry, the sailor. Now he's dead. Oh, what's that? Oh, ma. It's one of the murdered girls come to act for his body. Maybe it's been made into veal pie. Please, it wasn't me, Sir Ghost. I was only I had ten minutes ago. Silence, my friend. Are you in league with these fiends? I hope, Mr. Ghost, they aren't going to murder me as they did you before me. Whose ghost are you? My name is Mark Ingestry. <gasps> Merciful heavens, it's the sailor. Him that was murdered for his pearl. You know about that. You must be in league with the villain. Indeed, I am not. His wages is too high for an honest man. As Shakespeare says, mine only vice is honesty. Will you help me to bring Sweeney Todd to the hands of justice? Right you are, sir. But what are you stopping down here for? I don't know how it happened, but I suddenly fell into space. It was while I was being shaved. And I was knocked senseless on this stone floor. And when you come to? I suspected treachery. Since then, I've explored these vaults from end to end, seeking proof of the villain's guilt. How do we get out of here? Have you a stout heart? Me heart's stout enough, but my blood's running a trifle thin. What's your name? Jarvis Williams, sir. Do you know Joanna Oakley? Only by year, sir. You know where she lives? In Four Street, I think. Then go to her. No, no, that won't do. Go to her father. Tell him I'm alive and request him to communicate that intelligence to Miss Oakley. Let her know that there is yet hope. Are you going on living here? Yes, for the present. I must gather evidence and proof that Sweeney Todd is the malefactor I believe him to be. Can you keep a secret, Jarvis? Well enough, I suppose. And come with me through this passage. What more gory owes? Follow me. Up these stairs is a door that connects these vaults with Sweeney Todd's shop. This way. Right into the lion's mouth. There I will station myself, and there you will bring Mr. Oakley so that we may apprehend the villain. Quiet now. This must be Sweeney George's back room, sir. It is. And what of these walls not seen, Jarvis? Look through the door. It's Lupin. He's getting himself shy. Quiet, we may gather some clue. Listen to what they say. Say, Mr. Todd, not so hard, not so hard. What do you say? You're lathering me too hard. It's such a while since I had the pleasure of shaving you, Mr. Lupin. I wanted to make a good job of it. Mr. Todd, remember what a bountiful collection we had at church meeting yesterday evening. What of it? So the man of God can well afford that gracious offering known to the unrighteous as a tip. A tip, eh? Dear me, perhaps you are worth polishing off. What did you say, Mr. Todd? Uh, nothing, Parson. Pray shave me carefully, Mr. Todd, for I am to wear a wealthy heiress. I would fain make the wife of me booze. A wealthy heiress? And what's her name, may I ask? Mrs. Lovett, I'll wait, yeah. Silence. Would you ruin everything? Of a surety, she is not unknown to you. This Mrs. Lovett who owns a pie shop in Bell Yard, oh, that the Lord hath blessed with a trade both bountiful and ever flowing. What do you say, Mrs. Lovett? Then you are going to be polished off. Remain seated, sir. Lupin, sit down! <laughs> oh, no, you don't pitch me so easily, Mr. Todd. I have always been suspicious of your doings, and I prefer to stand. I should have suspected the chair. Come here, Mr. Lupin. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And now that I know how you manage it, and a sinful cunning trick it is, you'll pay blood money for it, Mr. Todd. Come back, Lupin. As you see, Mr. Todd, I am not ripe for killing yet. Oh! 
Yes, you are, Mr. Lupin. Very ripe. Very ripe indeed. Very ripe, very ripe, ripe, I cry. Young and old ones come and die. Very ripe, very ripe, ripe, I cry. Young and old ones come and die. When they sit in Sweeney's chair, off they go to heaven knows where. Mrs. Lovett surely knows where they go to all the him what goes. Where they go to all the him what goes. Very ripe, very ripe, ripe, I cry. Young or old ones, come and die. Oh, I'm off, Mr. Todd, we'll talk like you. I'll cut your throat from ear to ear when I catch you. Coast clear, Mr. Ingestray. What unparalleled horrors. I can't say I'm sorry to see old Lupin doing a bit of honest running for a change. See, Jarvis, this is the very chair in which I sat. And... Here's the chain the assassin pulls to tilt the chair and drop the victim into the depths below. And then into the furnaces where the bodies are incinerated. Fetch Mr. Oakley and the police officers. I will return to the vaults, for Sweeney Todd thinks me dead. And as long as he thinks so, he has an adversary he does not suspect. <laughs> that ranting parson has escaped me, but I fear no man of his kidney. A little money, an offering, he would call it. Blackmail, I should say. Merely a temporary disbursement to be returned along with all the other effects of the leg at all. <laughs> a pretty jest, the leg at all. And when he's been polished off, I'll deal with the rest of them. I have too many enemies to be really safe. My first step must be to get rid of Tobias Rag. I think he thinks. I need not take his life. But a close confinement of the boy in the lunatic asylum of Jonas Fogg will effectually silence him. <laughs> Mrs. Lovett too grows dissatisfied and scrupulous. I've had my eye on her for some time, and I fear she intends mischief. A little poison skillfully administered may remove any unpleasantness in that quarter. <laughs> So we need Todd. Spying, Mrs. Lovett. You might call it so, and since I discover that you intend treachery, I shall on the instant demand my share of the booty. Aye, an equal share of the fruits of our mutual bloodshed. Well, so you shall. I will balance accounts with you. What is the reckoning? I find it to be 12,000 pounds to a fraction. That is just... Six thousand pounds each, there be in two of it. But, Mistress Lovett, you will have to pay me for your support, lodging, and clothes. Clothes, Mr. Todd? I repeat the word, clothes. Why, I haven't had a new dress for these six months. Besides, am I to have nothing for your education? In killing, I mean, Mrs. Lovett. Oh, I have profited by that. To a degree, Mrs. Lovett, yes. For some years past, you have been totally provided for by me. And after deducting that and the expenses of erecting furnaces, purchasing flour for your delicious veal pies, we got the flour cheap because of the truck in it, and sundry other outlays, I find it leaves a balance of 16 shillings, fourpence, three farthings in my favor. In your favor? And I don't intend you to budge an inch until it is paid. You want to rob me, but you shall find to your sorrow I will have my due. You have instructed me in killing your side. Very well, Sweeney Todd. Twas you who purchased this knife. Don't be a fool, woman. Put your name to a deed consigning the owl of the wealth blood that's purchased all you perish. Idiot. You should have known Sweeney Todd better than that. I calculate my chances. I have also purchased this pistol. Todd. Throw down the knife. Todd, what are you going to do? Throw down the knife, woman. There it is, Todd. No, say your prayers. Your last hour has come. Spare well, my life, for the love of heaven, as I spared yours. Well, that's good, as you spared mine. 
It's funny that you ought to kill me. I'll stop before you spill my blood. I've been showed to you upon my guilty soul. Take your hands off me, woman. What about Lupin? It was in our interest, Todd, that I led him on. Shaw! Take your hands from about me neck. I don't like things crawling over me. Oh, Todd, a good lady told me of home where I could end my days in solitude and peace. Let me go to it again and beg it on my knees to show you the same mercy and compassion. Let us never see each other anymore. Let us leave better lives and forget we ever lived except in prayer. Will you lose your hold? It is never too late to repent, Todd. Never. It is too late for you. Good. Mrs. Lovett is dead, and there is blood upon me. Now Sweeney is alone. Now let the chair work, and let the furnaces consume the body, and destroy all evidence of my guilt in this, as it has in my manifold deeds of blood. <laughs> With Mrs. Lovett dead, Sweeney Todd had to do all his dirty work by himself. He lays her in the chair, tips it down into the vault, then hurries down the back stairs and through the dark passage to finish the job off. Ah, there you are, Mrs. Lovett. Somebody shot you. Tell me who did it. Tell Sweeney, and he'll cut their throats from ear to ear. Little crybaby, it's too bad you missed getting your share, isn't it? But don't worry, I'll revenge you. Hm, what right? Footsteps on the stair. No, in the passage. In the passage? Oh, but only Mrs. Lovett and that Ezekiel Smith knows about that passage, and they are dead. Go away! Your trade was a paying one, Mr. Todd. Sailor! I'm back, Mr. Todd. Go away, Mr. Sailor. You're dead. I denounce you, thief and murderer. I have caught you in the act of disposing of one of your unhappy victims. Wait a minute, Mr. Sailor. Would you like to go the way she went? I have lots of bullets left in this pistol, and Sweeney Todd has never been known to me. I do not fear you face to face, murderer. Come not a step closer. Then so die! <laughs> Sweeney Tom. Curse you! There. This pistol is too dangerous for you to handle. Now, Mr. Todd, with my own hands I shall drag you to the gallows and the end you so richly deserve. So, Mr. Sailor, the fortunes of war, eh? One false move and I'll shoot you as I would a mad dog. That's a bargain indeed. But, Sailor, what? Behind you! Ah! How's that for a bargain, eh? <laughs> what a weakling. So, Mr. Sailor, you see, I am still master of out here. Now, up those stairs, through the trap door into Mrs. Lovett's pie shop, and one lever locks all the doors. <laughs> You're lost now, Mr. Sailor. You'll never get out of this alive. And pretty soon you'll have company. <laughs> Verily, I have no wish to be included in this pursuit, Mr. Oakley. Lo, the roaring lion is abroad and no folks shall remain of a piece. But, uh, Mr. Lupin, our plan includes you, eh, Jarvis? We've got a place for Mr. Lupin, all right. My proper place is on guard, exhorting, keeping watch and ward. Let me be the encourager, Mr. Oakley. Uh, no, Mr. Lupin, you are to be the bait. <laughs> the bait? You are to go to Sweeney Todd's shop. Now listen carefully. Engage him in conversation. You can do that well enough. Provoke him to some damaging admission. Yes, yes. Then, when he is about to plunge his razor into your throat to silence you forever... <gasps> as late as that! It would not trick him otherwise. Then we will burst in, overpower him, and win the day! Hurrah! St. George for England! Verily, it does not appear to be so much like an holiday. It will make a man of you, Lupin. However weary he is, I'd everybody. I never did see such a man for distraction of the mind. It's the sailor! <laughs> 
Mark Ingestry, my dear boy. Have you caught the murderer? At last I have the proof of his guilt. I've seen the murderer at work. What poor soul was it this time? He has done away with his accomplice, Mrs. Lovett. <gasps> what? Sempronia gone woe to England and woe to Lupin. She was a nice old ma, too. She was round as the full moon and as fleshy as the goat that wanted on the delectable vultures. And thou perished. Gone like the flower of the field. He thinks me locked in his vaults, but I escaped by a secret tunnel. He made a great mistake in not killing you, Mr. Ingestry. Uh, for his own good, I mean. It is an error he will bitterly repent. Uh, Mark. I may call my future son-in-law Mark, I believe. Fully for you, Mr. Oakley. I may have dealt a pretty scurvily toward you in the past, but uh, all that's forgot, eh? Of course. Sir. Then let us call Johanna that you may greet your sweetheart before we take this murderer. Bully for you, Mr. Oakley. This young man is like the blackbird. He has but one song. I'll call her. Uh, Mrs. Oakley, bring Johanna at once. There is a good old friend of hers here. Now, just watch her face when she sees you, Mark. What is this, Mr. Oakley? Why do you thus disturb my after-dinner rest? Calling for Joanna with a voice like the bull of Bashan. A pious phrase, good Mrs. Oakley. Uh, what's this, Mrs. O? Is Joanna not here? Well, how can she be here when she's with this gentleman? With me, madam? With you, indeed, Mark Ingersby. And I must say, too, that it is not the proper thing to do, either. Sending a young woman notes like she was a trollop... Instead of an honest girl, tenderly nurtured. I sent Joanna no letter, Mrs. Oakley. You have no call to lie about it, Mr. Ingersby. Where is this letter? Here. Naturally, I took it from her, but she would go. What devil's work is this? This is not my hand. Not your... <gasps> then she has been abducted. I got it. Yes. Only one man could be responsible for this subterfuge. And that man is... Sweetheart! <laughs> Thank you, the mind has given way. Leave her where she lies. There's man's work to be done to the rescue. Once more unto the breach, as Shakespeare says. Sweeney Todd is doomed. But is there time to save Joanna Oakley? He is like a lion at bay now, enraged and unscrupulous. <laughs> <laughs> this enticed maiden shall be my surety of escape. What do you think, Miss Oakley? Do your worst, you ruffian. Though my dear parents and Mr. Ingestry hold me dear, they will never let the reflection sway them in the performance of their duty. Have I not a singular grace in writing love letters? Oh, you do ill to taunt someone who is in your power, Mr. Todd. You would not dare do it if Mr. Ingestry were here. But he is here, my dear. And you shall see him in a little while. You shall join your lover in the vaults below. But first... Just what? Don't be frightened. I'm not going to harm you yet. <laughs> I just want you to be a witness. I'll be no witness to your doings, Sweeney Todd. I have a young apprentice who has shown distressing signs of madness lately. Fancy I caught him yesterday stealing away to denounce me to the magistrate. Is that not an undoubted form of madness? I think he did well. Look, we'll have him in. It's near time for the keepers to arrive anyway, and you can judge his madness for yourself. I keep him in this room. Come on. Tobias Frank, I won't enjoy it. I won't be knocked about in this way. You won't, eh? <laughs> <laughs> you are a designing, cruel, and cold-blooded murderer. There, you see, Miss Oakley, these are genuine ravings. Miss Oakley, have you lured her into your den, too? Now, don't you wish you'd been loyal to me, you dog, when we do such a brisk business? Have no fear, Tobias. Help! will come. <laughs> Tobias will be far from help, and very soon. We are safe! <laughs> come in, Jonas Fogg. Now, Tobias, my boy, do you consider yourself saved? We need to all if my memory don't deceive me. You are right. I'm not easily forgotten, I believe. You have brought the water. They are outside in the carriage. Good. Now, Jonas Fogg, I have another apprentice here who has shown such symptoms of insanity that it becomes, I regret to say, necessary to place him under your care. Indeed, does he rave? He says I am a murderer. A murderer? <laughs> yes, isn't it? 
Could anything be more absurd? I that have the milk of human kindness flowing in me every vein. For how long, Miss Todd, do you think this malady will continue? I will pay for 12 months. But I do not think between you and I that the case will last anything like so long. I think he will die like young Simpkins suddenly. I shouldn't wonder if he did. It is decidedly the best way. It prevents expense. We make no remarks and we ask no questions. Those are the principles on which we have conducted our establishment for so long. Those are the principles upon which we shall continue to conduct it into merit, we hope, the patronage of the public. None questionably. Uh, but which is the patient? I perceive you have two of them. Pay no attention to the girl. This boy is the one. Quite young. Pity, isn't it? And, of course, we deeply lament his condition. Of course. But see, he raises his eyes. He will speak directly. Rave, I should say. Sweeney Todd is a murderer, and I denounce him. There, you see him? Mad, indeed. Save me from him. It is my life he seeks because I know he is a murderer. Miss Oakley, add your voice to mine. Mr. Fogg, if you have any sympathy or justice in you, you will help us. This seems to be communicable insanity in its most terrible form. I shall be upon the necessity of putting him in a straight whiskey. Mr. Todd, let me have both of them. No, the girl is a, shall I say, a deposit left for my safekeeping. But there, uh, Jonas Fogg, why shouldn't you have both of them? Why shouldn't I deposit her with you? <laughs> Valuable security should always be banked, Mr. Todd. Hmm. A pleasant little jest, Jonas Fogg. <laughs> <laughs> Take them both! A good day's business. Convey them to one of the dark, damp cells. As too much light encourages their delirium. Villain, do your worst! I shall always aver that Sweeney Todd is an assassin. It is true. Take him away! I will die before I submit to you or your vile myrmidon. Why, then you'll die, for no power can aid you. Yes, there is one. Where? There is heaven, which fails not to succor the helpless and persecuted. Cushers! I am undone. Quick, bolt the door, Jonas Fogg. Too late, Sweeney Todd. Much too late, Mr. Todd. Mark! Hand off, you cowardly rascals, and I'll put the kibosh on the old consarm. The kibosh? Yes, it's a word of Greek extraction, meaning the hop set of the hapelkorn. You'll hang now, Sweeney Todd. And Mark Ingestry. You? Yes, Sweeney Todd. Mark Ingestry, who, preserved from death by a miracle, returns to confound the guilty and to protect the innocent. <laughs> And that's how Sir Weenie Todd, the notorious bloody murderer of Fleet Street, was brought to justice and finally hanged at Tyburn. Mark Ingestry recovered his pearls, laid them at his sweetheart's feet, and gained her parents' consent. And what do you think Mark Ingestry did besides? Tobias Rag, do you still want to follow the sea? Oh, yes, indeed, Mr. Ingersby. Then I shall buy you a commission in His Britannic Majesty's Navy. Bully for you, Mr. Ingersby. And furthermore... <laughs> Mr. Lupin, if you are agreeable, you shall perform the rites at our wedding. Bully for you, Mr. Ingersby. And furthermore... <laughs> Jarvis Williams, I'm going to buy you the biggest cart in London and outfit it with the best greens and taters money can buy. That seems to have silenced the youth. Let me say it. A verily bully for thee, Mark Ingestry. And furthermore... Hurrah! Throughout our married life, Joanna, my dear... Yes, Mark? I will never ask you to make a veal pie. Hurrah! <laughs> Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. First produced at the Britannia Theatre, Hoxton, in 1842. Was written by George Dibden Pitt. And here adapted by Ronald Hamilton as item 16 of stage 47. Produced and directed by Andrew Allen. With an original musical score composed with tongue-in-cheek. And conducted by Lucio Agostini. Starred as Sweeney Todd, Maver Moore. With Lister Sinclair as the guide. John Draney as Tobias. Bud Knapp as Mr. Smith. 
Lloyd Bochner as Mark Ingestry, Frank Wade as Parmine, Jane Mallet as Mrs. Lovett, Tommy Tweed as Parson Lupin, Kathleen Kidd as Mrs. Oakley, Glenn Burns as Mr. Oakley, Arden Kay as Joanna, Bernard Braden as Jarvis Williams, and Alan King as Jonas Fogg. Fred Tudor made all the sinister sounds, and Bruce Armstrong did the technical operations. 